Hello, 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 everyone. I want to welcome you to the show. You are here live with Dave Jose. Today we are going to have on one of the representatives from Arizona, uh, Mr. Austin Smith. Actually, he's in the uh, waiting room already. Uh, how are you doing today, sir? Hey, David. Thanks for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. I'm going to go ahead and connect you so you can uh, come on. Um, we are live now. I definitely wanted to thank you for coming on. I know you only had 20 minutes, so um, I wanted to kind of try to keep the, uh, the questions kind of pointed. Um, but first of all, can you just introduce yourself? I know you only got 20 minutes. I got probably two or three questions. Um, but can you introduce yourself and let people know a little bit about you? And let me humbly thank you for actually coming on and speaking with the people, that is something that takes a lot of courage and a lot of care. Of course. Well, David, thanks for having me on. I'm glad I'm glad you reached out, and I always want to be available to patriots all across the country and across the state of Arizona. But like David mentioned, I'm Austin Smith. I'm a, a freshman representative in the Arizona House of Representatives. I serve in the Arizona Freedom Caucus. I'm the vice chairman of the Natural Resources, Energy, and Water Committee. I'm on the Ways and Means Committee and on the Municipal Oversight and Elections Committee. Um, we have a recess this week because they are obviously, uh, you all know, picking a replacement for uh, Representative Harris. And so, um, but I'm always want to be available to the people who ask one, one questions, a listening session, whatever it needs to be. And, and I'm happy to be here with you guys. So, Well, that's super huge because, you know, in politics, it has kind of been forgotten that uh, government officials are actually the servants of the people. And so when it comes time to be able to talk is kind of hard at times to get people uh, to take time if they don't understand um, exactly what the people's powers are, what the people's rights are, and how things uh, should go. So it's, it's huge that you are uh, doing this today. Now, I know you mentioned about the replacement for Liz Harris. Now, of course, one of the things that is hot, a hot topic in Arizona right now, is what happened uh, with Liz Harris. Now, is it true that you are one of the people who did not vote uh, to have her expelled? That is correct. I voted no. And even though the Arizona Constitution does give the members um, the authority within the House to expel a member, that should be used judiciously and mm -hmm. very intensely used. And that's why I voted no. Okay, now, it's really deep because you, you said that... Um, the Arizona Constitution actually does grant or delegate that power uh, to remove um, government officials inside of the legislature. They can come together and remove. And I do agree that that is a power. And it, for me, I, I like to ask this so that the world can see and so kind of everybody can see what's on the table and what people believe. So... When I look at the constitutions of the states, I realize that the people came together, as we can see in the preambles across the country, and wrote constitutions granting authority to uh, fill seats, which those seats would take care of certain delegated items. So when you see in the state constitution where it says that the legislature is being granted power to remove any actor that is doing wrong, do you see that as the people having a power that they're granting the legislature to also carry out in regards to their business? Or, or in other words, would you think that the people would have that same power to remove bad actors if we are able to give the government uh, that power? It's a great question, David. I'm glad you brought it up because, you know, as a, as a constitutional conservative, like as I read this article four, part two in the Arizona Constitution talks about a removal of a member from the legislature. Mm -hmm. So the people did give that power in our constitution to the members. Now we have got a million different things going on that are way more important than removing a member, whether mm -hmm. you agree with Liz or not we have way bigger fish to fry to save this country rather than removing a member. I wish mm -hmm. the leadership would have taken a different direction on it. They didn't. And it forced all of us to have to make that decision to expel a member or not. We've got like, that's, that was one of my reasons. And, and when I was asked by people why I voted the way I did, and I was like, 
guys, we have way bigger issues with our elections, the way the country is going, protecting children, securing the border, figuring out our water crisis here in Arizona. Those things are way more important about the future of this republic than expelling a member right now. There's people who can't even fill up their gas tanks. We've got families that are trying to just make ends meet with their mortgages, paying rent, their ta tax day is tomorrow. That is the duty that the people have elected us, have given us that power to do on behalf of them. And if we're not fulfilling those duties and those missions, no wonder the people are upset. No wonder the people have their grievances with their government. Because like I said, there was only you know a handful of us to, who voted the way that they did. There's some members that I respect that, that voted yes. But at the end of the day, David, our job is to protect the Constitution and, and carry out the will of the people. And that's something I campaigned on, and I'm working every single day to keep that promise as long as I'm in the House of Representatives. Now, it's powerful you said that because you said that the duty is to protect the Constitution or protect the state or the body politic. And, and that's something that's huge because I can see where our forefathers who defeated the king, right? Um they were in a situation where they were being oppressed and attacked and government was going after their own property, their rights, and they were trying to remove by statute um, their ability to function as a people. And, and one of the things that would happen is, is that the, the government, I'm sorry, the people would try to redress their grievances with the government, tell them, hey, you guys don't have authority to take away our power, take away our rights. You guys are supposed to protect us in our liberties. And you're doing the opposite. And this was the precursor to our forefathers saying, you know what? We're just going to exercise our power to remove ourselves from under any authority or connection with you. And we are going to start over. Now, when we understand and we look at uh, government officials, we see a situation where we are in a place where we are in the danger of maladministration, meaning you brought up a lot of good issues, the border um, elections. A lot of things are in disarray and the people are upset about it. And we should be focusing on those things and getting those things fixed. But what ends up happening is, is that uh, many politicians are telling us, well, our hands are tied. Oh, we gave that power to the board of supervisors. There's nothing we could do. Or the attorneys are telling us there's nothing we could do. We can't deal with this situation. And constitutionally, I don't think that's a legitimate argument because the purpose of government is to take care of the body politic and make sure that the people are safe and everything is secure. And our forefathers said this as the fundamental principles of law, that when any government official, I'm sorry, when any government, any government in any state is inadequate or not keeping the people safe, that the people have an inherent right to remove them at will without an election on the spot. This is what they did to the king. So I asked you the question about the state constitution of Arizona, because if the people granted an authority to you guys to be able to remove a politician, which I agree with, remove a legislative body member, I agree that you have that power. Would you say that you believe that the people who wrote those constitutions have the power to do that with the rest of the government officials who are not acting in accordance with what we like? Another another great question, David. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, everything like you brought up the Board of Supervisors, perfect example, the counties, the cities and the towns, they are political subdivisions of the state. Mm -hmm. The legislators are the office closest to the people. That's why we have 30 legislative districts up to 200,000 people. Those 200,000 people are the key ones. They are the ones who are in charge of the entire government body of the state. And so whether that's through themselves, through just being community activists, or using their legislators, they are the ones in charge. That's why it's so important to be a precinct committee man. So you can be the first person that knows your legislator by name and usually has their cell phone number to be able to encourage them, ask them, demand of them to do the job that they were elected to do under the United States and the Arizona Constitution. That's mm -hmm. how it's supposed to work. The office closest to the people is the legislature. Everything else falls under that. That's how, and I'm glad you keep bringing up the founding fathers. That's why they wrote the Constitution the way that they did. And because our, our politicians now have given so much power to bureaucratic agencies, to the board of supervisors, they've kicked the can down the road because they don't want to have to make those tough decisions. They don't want to be put into a corner because they're afraid about their reelection, so on and so forth. Well, who cares? This is a citizen legislature. That's the key word, 
citizen legislator, that anybody can do it, that anybody can be a member of their legislature. And so I totally agree with you. The people have the, the duty, the obligation to remove people from office if they feel that they are breaking their oath to the Constitution. And so it's always going to be up to the people to make those to make those decisions, whether that's that's through a recall, demanding a resignation, telling them to get out of office. That is all still clearly laid out. And so I couldn't agree with you more, David. I'm glad you brought it up. So let me ask you this, because you, you, you make so many good points and, you know, it's a breath of fresh air to actually see someone who is in politics, who understands the role of the people, the power of the people. Um, when you look at how things work in, in Arizona today, when it comes to the business being handled uh, by government, I know that one part of the business that's handled is the writing of bills, right? Mm -hmm. But do you find that the other side of the inherent right of the people being able to petition their government? And as you spoke of earlier, uh, bringing forth a redress of grievances. Do you find that, that the legislature of Arizona is focused daily on hearing the grievances of the people? Because when you look at the state constitutions, if the forefathers left in there that there has to be a redress of grievances and that we can do it by petition, remonstrance, address, etc., all of those deal with being able to bring the law and the, the way that things should function and the harms that have happened to you to, to any branch of government, the legislature, uh, the executive branch, or the courts. For some reason, a lot of government officials believe that the courts are the only ones who have the power to make a determination over what's going on, but the legislature being the closest to the people, when something is wrong, there is a right of inherent right from God of petition, remonstrance and address that comes from uh i'm sorry that is a right of the people and so do you find that the legislature has been open and discussing the idea that they should be daily allowing people to come in tell what their grievances are without hindrance without censoring them have you found in the legislature that that's something that's happening daily it's, it's very interesting david because We've probably got, you know, I'm a freshman and I've been involved in kind of grassroots politics for the last several years now. But now that I get to be a legislator and I've wrote it, I've only wrote, I only wrote four bills this year. And um, you would be amazed by how so many lawmakers, they'll be running 50 or 60 bills when that just continues to grow government and state statute and crushes the people. That's the, that's the whole reason why some of them do it. They just have so many bills that the average person can't understand what some of these law, law, laws are. And you even have some lawmakers that don't understand it. They're called lobbyist mules, David. Yep. There's members of the <laughs> that are lobbyist mules. Let a lobbyist will bring up a bill and say, this is what you got to run. This will help you with your reelection. This is good for the state. And, and there'll be hundreds of pages long. Perfect example, David. We had a bill this year that was over the universal or the uniform commercial code, which is obviously our currency. Wow. And we, stopped, the Freedom Caucus, we stopped digital bank currency in Arizona because Representative Corey McGar, who represents Tucson, Great, or uh, Pima County area and Pinal County, he read that bill. Even though it was hundreds of pages long, he was like, oh my gosh, this is going to enact digital bank currency here in the state of Arizona. And so that's just one example of many of other ones that most people don't know about, the bills that we're preventing from getting out of committee or getting onto the board because the average citizen can't come always and uh, address their grievances to the legislature because mm -hmm. they have to work, they have a family. And when they do, they should be respected that time when they come and testify in front of us, in front of a bill, in front of a committee. Whether you agree with that testimony that they're saying about uh, a law or uh, something that they believe is unconstitutional, our job as legislators is to respect that. Now, I'll give it. It can get out of hand. It gets a little hot and feisty. We want to protect the, the, the people there. We want to protect their rights and, and, and respect their grievances from it. But as lawmakers, we signed up to hear those grievances. If the members of the legislature aren't doing their job and members and, and citizens are showing up and they're upset and frustrated, they have every right to be, whether we agree with what they're saying or not. Maybe maybe we just have a different opinion from them. But that's the beauty thing about being able to remove members of the legislature and people that you get elected because they're not kings and queens. They're not supposed to be lifetime politicians. They're supposed to be patriots that rise up. And so I think we're in a critical point in, in the state's history where we're seeing a seismic shift in how people pay attention to their legislatures. Because 
most people, David, don't know who their state reps are, who their state senators are, because, mm -hmm. you know, there's if there's media coverage of it, it's usually liberal and it has a bias on it. It's usually because they kind of fly under the radar. And that's why I would argue that state legislatures are more swampy or can be more swampy than Washington, D.C., because yes. they fly under the radar. They're never pressed by their constituents. They never have they never show up to the legislative district meeting. They don't do calls like this because they're they're too busy. I'm like, well, we're all busy. We all have lives, but we signed up to do a job. We took an oath to defend the Constitution of the state of Arizona and the United States. And so when the people want to redress their grievances to you, whether in the legislature in session or not, you need to be willing and open to hear that because that's the only thing that's going to change things. Stop running lobbyist bills. Listen to the people. Run constituent driven bills. There is probably, you know, there's several of us lawmakers, I want to say, that ran constituent driven bills. I ran the HCR to prevent ranked choice voting in the jungle primary here in Arizona. Couldn't get it signed by the governor. She said she wouldn't sign it. But in order to amend Arizona's constitution, that's another beautiful thing about Arizona's constitution. There are pros and cons to our proposition process because we'll get things on the ballot that are really, really bad. But we can get some things on there for the people to decide rather than lawmakers. And so Amen. amending Arizona's constitution gives that straight to the people. And yes, our elections oh, are really wow. We don't have a choice when it comes to amending Arizona's constitution. So there's a lot of things where us as lawmakers need to remember that we don't just have to pass a bill to make something better. We give that ex extremely, uh, I, I think we do it way too much. We're going we're gonna to fix the law to get this. Representative Justin Heap from Mesa, he has an HCR, which uh, is um, going to hopefully go on the ballot. I think it's passed out of the Senate. That will give us a session to go back in in October to start repealing laws without an executive uh, signature. Well, it'll just be the, a simple majority in the House and the Senate to start repealing laws. I think that is one of the biggest things that will change the dynamic of this country is if Arizona comes straight out of the gate and says, no, 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 we're going to take that power away back from the Board of Supervisors. We're taking that power back away from the executive, from the bureaucratic agencies, and give it directly to the people tell us which laws they want repealed, and we go straight in there and do it with simple majorities. When I see it's powerful that you said that. You said a couple of things. So... One of the things about the um, the bills that are being written and smashed out by certain legislative body members, I used to uh, teach or give information of the constitutions to uh, Senator David Farnsworth um, a couple mm -hmm. years ago. And I witnessed personally how the legislative process works. And I realized that the state constitutions across the country have what's called a distribution of powers. Um, it's Article mm -hmm. 3 in Arizona. And what it does is it tells that the officers of one branch of government are not allowed to use the power of another branch. So, for instance, when it comes to the legislature, we grant the legislature the power to write bills. Now, the, the scope of the bills that are being written is a is one big huge issue that most people don't know when it when it comes to the law is is actually an infringement and then mm -hmm. there is another part where the the ledge council and different attorneys and judges are actually telling members of the legislature we need you to put this in we need you to do this we need you to do this where officers of the courts as attorneys make a majority of their money off of taking people to court now, when you understand this conflict of interest, it will blow your mind. I'll give you an example. When you look in Arizona, uh, ARS 8-453, I, I kind of specialize in a CPS situation. That's one of my favorites because I had a fight with them. But um, ARS 8-453, A15 allows for uh, the, head of, the head of DCS to act as a federal agent in everything that he does in the furtherance of DCS. And then when you go to federal statute and look at the law that created CPS, it says in uh, 1935 Social Security Act 11016D, nothing in this act shall authorize any federal agent, officer, or representative to take charge of any child over the objection of either parent or person standing in local parentheses to such child. So what you have is federal law saying that this law was not created to snatch people's kids. But then you have Arizona law saying that the head of DCS could be a federal agent in a partnership where they make money on the side. But then you also have the Arizona Constitution that all the politicians swear to that says 
If you want to take life, liberty, or property from anybody, you have to have a trial by jury. And this is why I bring this up and I give this example. When the legislature is writing bills that go against the people's power, we have like John Locke, who, who mm -hmm. is a fundamental uh, foundational forefather of law. He helped create the law that, that we use as a republic. And he explains that when the legislature or the prince or whoever's in the executive branch starts to create law that lets the power of the people or their rights or their property be taken, they actually dissolve their own power because they're going against their purpose, as you spoke about earlier. So when the, when the legislature is working with the officers of the court, the officers of the court as the bar association, right? They're pretty much all members of the bar. They need mm. to have cases in order to make money. So when there's all these bills being pumped out that people don't have a chance to read, sometimes yep. the result of those bills is an attack on the rights of the people. And I had to say all this because you blew my mind when you brought that up. I'm like, wow, who is this guy? Right? Because you never hear politicians speaking the way that you do. And then you said, I'm a freshman. I said, oh my gosh, this must be one of those guys that God put in place to do the real work. And you haven't been tainted or poisoned because for you to speak the way that you do. And I, I specialize in the state constitutions. The reason I do is because the United States Constitution only touches a few things for local and state politicians. You know, it'll say, look, you can't go against people's rights to freedom of speech. You can't do this or that. Very few things, you know, can't infringe upon their right to bear arms. But when it comes to how the state is going to be ran in the Arizona Constitution, for instance, it tells you that the people have a right to do initiative and the legislature can't interfere. So we can right. literally come with laws, block the legislature from interfering if they don't want to fix things and the people don't know this. Now, where you came in and you talked about the process where you guys can do initiative or referendum or put things on the ballot for the people to make a decision. It's mind blowing to hear you say that because out of my years of talking to politicians, when the, when the Arizona audit happened, I taught Karen Fan how to do it. I actually wrote the affidavits to tell her to get started. I showed her how to stop Perkins Coy. I showed her how to stop the DOJ and made Zoom videos for her to know how to block any encroachment of government against her. I even showed her how to use the legislative manual, the, the Mason's Manual of Legislative Procedure, in order to use her investigatory powers, which are in there that nobody taught her, no attorney taught her. And I showed her how to use them in order to do inquisition to make new legislation. So you know, if you paid attention, she never talked about fraud. She never said, well, I'm trying to find some fraud somewhere. She would always say, I'm trying to find out what happens so we can make new future legislation. It is a 100% guaranteed right of the legislature under the common law that the legislature can inquire upon anything wherewith they could write future legislation and they don't know. So when it comes to the board of supervisors, right? If they didn't turn, <laughs> excuse me, turn over the ballots in 2020, the legislature can inquire to find out what happened. Excuse me. If the paper was the wrong size, the legislature can do subpoenas and inquire, and they can even go as far, and, and, and this is another deep thing, the Mason's Manual of Legislative Procedure, which is backed by court cases, actually says that the legislature can actually come together and send um, the sergeant at arms to go mm -hmm. pick up the machines, go pick up whatever they want. They can also do it with the sheriff based on precedence. Right. Now, the sad thing is, is that as I have dealt with a lot of the politicians to get a lot of stuff done, I realized that they didn't know what their own documents said. They didn't even realize what they swore to. And, and, and I found out that when ledge counsel and, and other actors are getting involved in trying to show what people's duties are, they're not showing these things or they're allowing people to swear to the state constitution without even knowing what's in it. And it, it causes an issue because all these bills get passed. And, and 
and and and that's an issue in itself. That was the other thing I was saying. There's a part of the issue of bills being passed where our politicians are being taught that they could even write bills against our rights or liberty. Mm-hmm. We, when, when you look at constitutions, the constitutions have delegated authority or grants. The state constitution has a general grant of authority, and then the statutes are made in pursuance with more specific things that the government is allowed to do. So if we never granted an authority to take away our life, liberty, or property, and we said that the purpose of government in Article 2, Section 2 is to protect our individual rights, it would be a conflict of interest as trustees to create any group of bureaucrats, any agency, or any statute that would remove our right. And here's where it gets deeper. They're writing statute that removes rights from the people And they don't even allow a trial by jury in most of these agency hearings, traffic stuff, but there's a, but there's a federal program where they all make money, CPS stuff, federal program where they all make money, no jury, child support enforcement, federal program where they're all, they're all making money on the side, not as, not as government officials, because the actors inside of these cases get separate money from federal funds and they get paid their regular pay as government officials. So when you understand that bills are being popped out that say we could take something from the people with no jury, but the highest law, the state constitution, swear you swear in the general law that you will never go against the people's power, take away their right to trial by jury. It says it shall be inviolate. It also tells how they have to do all the processes. The superior courts, the appeals court, the Supreme Courts must be courts of record. Now, the funny thing is, if you look at the law books, the attorneys have actually changed. And this is something you can look up to see if I'm a liar or not. If you look at Black's Law 4, there's a definition of what a court of record is. You look up Black's Law 5, they remove three of the things and only leave two. You get to Black's Law 6, it's approximately one to one and a half. So in a court of record, in order to take something from somebody, right, you have have to have a court that moves by the common law. Now, I know that they say the common law is some old stuff that doesn't exist anymore. But to prove to you that that's not the case, you could go to ARS 1-201. And when you read ARS 1-201, it will blow your mind if you don't know it already. I can see that you're well studied. But it actually tells that whenever the people come before the court by necessity and they have a need, that the court must move by the common law. It actually says that in Arizona statute 1-201. Now, the reason this is so important is because administrative hearings don't move by the common law. Mm -hmm. They move by statutes and codes that are at a lower level of due process than the common law. Why is this important? The reason this is important is because you guarantee a trial by jury. You guarantee that the people have due process of law. You guarantee in Article 2, Section 11 that the court cases will not be without unnecessary delay and they will be open. But what's happening is they're writing statute that are creating closed courts in a lot of different areas where they don't have to use a jury, which means they're prosecuting you by a report from some agency or entity. And then they're taking things, but they never use the constitutional process that's the highest that they promised. Why is this important? Let's go back to Leah Harris. It's crazy that they are removed. They have removed Liz Harris for now. And they say, well, we have a report. And the report is based on administrative things, right? Which is fine. But the problem you're going to have is, is that the report that they're using to remove Liz Harris, no jury has found that Liz Harris has done wrong. It's just a report. Now, here's where you're going to run into a problem. The report of this woman, Berger, which I don't care what she says, the Thaler guy, right? I I don't know them. But they are people who have the power and the right to petition government about what they see wrong so the government can fix it. So the people have a 100% guaranteed right to report to government and tell them what they see wrong so people can look into it. 
So when Liz Harris opens the door to allow somebody to talk about what they think is wrong based on what they find, how is it that Liz Harris can be removed by a report that's not proven by anybody in a trial by jury, in a court of record, but then they're upset if someone says something about other politicians based on the word of one of the people, which have a higher status. So the people, they don't want the people to come saying things that might embarrass or bring shame on the legislature. But one of the guaranteed rights of the people is to come and redress their grievance or make known their issues to the legislature openly, freely speaking, and then being responsible. This is in the state constitution for what they say. But that was kind of used to get Liz Harris and attack her over what someone else said that they have a right to say. This is where it gets a little deep. And I'm not trying to pull you into this. I'm just saying it mm -hmm. so you can kind of see from one of the people what's going on, what we see. But I see that you're somebody who cares about the Constitution and what's right. But uh, can you, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> can you, <coughs> excuse me, can you see where the people if they have an issue with anything that the legislature is the closest to them, right? The representative, the house, the Senate ain't the closest, but you guys are. And if we are going to have redress or grievance, anytime anything is going wrong in our body politic and we're not safe, it's a grievance. Mm -hmm. Something isn't right. We're grieved. We're hurting. We, we need to warn our servants who we grant authority to take care of certain things so they can make sure we're safe. So we don't have to wait until government uh, is in a position. Uh, sorry, we don't have to wait until government is in a position where things fall all the way apart before we fix or, or give government information to take action so they can prevent wrong. Yeah. And I think that in the lack of teaching of the state constitutions, much of the government in the state, the legislature has failed to realize that we are, we actually have an inherent right. Like for instance, the Michigan constitution, which all of our rights are equal. It says that our forefathers tell that we have the power to instruct our representatives. In New Hampshire, it tells that we have the ability to instruct them and demand an exact due regard to the law that we gave them. So think about this. At the same time that we are to instruct our servants and help them see what they should do to protect our state, attorneys are often telling our servants, hey, you need to write this bill, this bill, this bill. And as you said earlier, and I praise you for it, you, you are an amazing man. Like, it's a breath of fresh air to just hear you speak. Don't ever change, sir, please. But... The, the attorneys and different entities and, and lobbyists are actually teaching our legislature how to make cases against the people and restrict right. us when they're here to benefit us. And they don't know that we're supposed to be instructing them. As a matter of fact, as a whole, I, I just want you to think about this. And I'll ask you this for, for my audience because I always tell them this and we rarely get a chance to, to have discussions like this. But this is amazing. And thank you for giving out so much of your time, sir. You, you have been awesome and great. And you've been open and you've, you've spoken from the heart. So I can only give you uh, praise for that. This has been an amazing day. But I want to ask you, how many times as a freshman legislate, legislator have you seen one of the regular people come to you and present actual law in detail from the state constitution showing how things are supposed to be. Not an attorney, not a lobbyist. Exactly how the things are supposed to be in the state David, could you repeat the question? Okay, I'm sorry. So how many time at times as a freshman legislator, not attorneys, not lobbyists, have you seen just regular everyday people walk in or send you notices with the exact law of how the government is supposed to work in a state, exactly what you're supposed to do based on the state constitution. And, and, and the people actually demand 
that you follow a certain process based on what you swore to. Like how many people not just came and said, you know what, I don't like this. Or I got a problem with how you're doing things. Or I feel like you ran over my rights, right? Not just complaining, not just saying they got a gripe. But how many are going to the specific items in the state constitution? I'll give you an example. Has anybody ever went brought to you Article 7, Section 7 of Arizona Constitution and said, hey, did you know that it says that only legal votes can count and that if the legislature, I'm sorry, if the government officials are not following, if they're not following the exact law the way that it's written, then it nullifies the election? Or have they brought to you Article 7, I think it's Section 12, where it tells that the legislature and the government, including Katie Hobbs, guarantees that they will make law. It says that there shall be made laws to strengthen the election franchise and to make sure that there are no infringements or encroachments against it. So that's in the state constitution. Do you find that the people have not just come to you complaining or just saying things, but actually giving you the actual law where you can go in there, find where it says it in the state constitution, take it to the other legislators and say, hey, wait, guys, did you know right here in Article 14, Section 18, that it says that no company doing business in this state can give money to interfere with an election? Facebook can't give millions of dollars to this state or to the political subdivisions to change elections. That's already in the state constitution. Have you seen people come to you with that level of precision to actually uh, use your power to, to actually make sure that their grievances are taken care of, showing you which way to go? No, David, I haven't. Other than you, this is the first time I've actually ever got to have a real in-depth conversation about the Constitution of the state of, the, of Arizona, and I'm extremely grateful for it, David. This was even um, some informative stuff for me, too, because as a legislator, I'm still learning and, and, and you know, figuring out how to, how, to, how to be woven into the Constitution when I do stuff. But uh, you're right, there's not – the average citizen – the average American just doesn't know to dive into the Constitution and to wield that power and that authority. And I think now you're going to start seeing that more with, with everything that you're doing. I think we got to keep doing it because we have to have I want I want to see more citizens in members office than lobbyists. That's Amen. what we really need right now, because <laughs> as we keep mentioning, these laws, these laws, are getting, these laws are getting drawn up, they just pounce on top of the people. And it's just a weight. And we can't ever get rid of them unless we repeal them or we have a, a repeal session or something because we're just we're, we're going around the rights of the people by making these laws and 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 members are being uh you know bamboozled around they're being used that's why i said they're lobbyist mules they're just yeah. adding on statute on top of statute on top of statute giving the power to these attorneys and, and they've got to make money somehow they want to give the the the, the like i'm glad you brought up the subpoena power in the arizona constitution uh, and in the House rules, it gives the, the chairman of a committee plus the, the Speaker of the House or the Senate president, they both have to sign off on subpoenaing. That's why it was so hard to do it with the Board of Supervisors, because you had to get a committee chair at the time, Warren Peterson and Karen Fan, to subpoena these guys. The same exact thing applies to the House of Representatives here. But we've kind of lost that because we've already delegated so much power to agencies and to the political subdivisions of this state. And it used to be the old conservative ad, just like, well, we want the power to be local and control is like i disagree with that the power is inherent in the legislature Ooh. because the laws are supposed to be equally applied to everybody amen everybody in the state everything under the that are subdivisions of the state that's why i'm so much in favor of, of breaking up maricopa county and having a uh, different boards of supervisors because the, the power is so heavy in maricopa county that the legislature is irrelevant they yep. openly and defy the legislature, the laws that the people have Ooh, written. That's why I always oh try gosh. to say we run oh constituent driven bills, not lobbyist driven bills. Our purpose as lawmakers, like I said, citizen legislators, and I'll close it with this the citizen legislature is supposed to mean something. It's very clear in what it says is that the, every citizen can run for the legislature, can be a part of it. And so when you take that oath to the Constitution, you're taking it to the state of Arizona and the United States of America, but it's the people that you're supposed to represent in carrying out that oath to the Constitution. And so every vote that you make, every time that, that we have a, a massive vote, when it goes against the Constitution or, or, or like we, you've got to try, we got to try to kill these bills. But it, it's so hard to kill a bill because they've already got the numbers and some of us are just in the minority on it trying to kill a bill, especially those of us in the Freedom Caucus trying to kill a bill. And you've got all this 
pressure from the lobbyist groups, from the bureaucratic agencies who continue to tell us, you know, we need this bill or we need this legislation and do this. If we don't do this, X, Y, or Z is going to happen. And the longer I have been down there, we're on month four now in session, just got over the 100 day mark, I believe. And the more I've been down there, David, the more I've understand that not a lot of good comes out of that place because the people do not know how to flex their constitutional muscle. The average citizen doesn't. And mm -hmm. members of the legislature who just, who just run for office and want to be in office don't know how to read and understand the Constitution. I don't know as much about the Arizona Constitution as you do, David. I'm glad we had this conversation because now I have some notes here to start going and doing some more homework on when we, when we end this session and get and get prepared for the next one. So I just, I just want to thank you, David. This was a fantastic conversation. I've got so much notes here to start doing homework on. And, and, and like I said, anything that I can do to be available to you and to your audience and my office is always open at the legislature. Um, and, and you just know, like if, if I may not even go back next year, I may not even get reelected because the lobbyists may run money against me to oust me, but I, but I, I stand firm in my votes and how I vote. I try to stand. I stand with the people. I stand with the Constitution. When you take that oath, it's supposed to mean something. And the states created the federal government, not Amen. the other way around. Oh we God. created the federal government. The state has the power to do what we need necessary because it's the people. The legislature, the Le Arizona legislature, the House and the Senate, is supposed to be the most powerful body in the country, along with the other 49 states. So yeah. I'll just end it with that, David. I appreciate you, ma'am. Well, let me tell you really quickly. Write down Article 2, Section 1, Fundamental Principles is super important. Um, I want to thank you, sir, for coming on and actually um, showing the truth to the people. Guys, it is so important <clears throat> that we have these opportunities to know and discuss the law and to understand what is clearly written. Um, as you guys get to see, when the real government servants get an opportunity to talk with the people, we see things happen that you could never imagine. You, you see, uh oh, he's still here. Let me get him back on because I wanted to ask him to check out one thing. Hey, I'm sorry. It, somehow we got broke up a little bit, but I just wanted to tell you, please write down Article 2, Section 1 of Arizona Constitution where it talks about fundamental principles and Tell me if you can, when you get a chance, if you can find what they are and why nobody has ever talked to you about them because they are sworn to. So there's fundamental principles that the government in Arizona says that the people have a 100% guaranteed right to frequently bring to you. Not like a two minute committee hearing, but we get to come teach. And it's important. And I want to say uh, before you go that you doing what you have done today, I don't think that you're going to have a problem with getting reelected or becoming one of the most powerful fighters for the people in America. Here's why. The people are looking for solutions. The people are looking for people who will speak truth. They're looking for people who will stand with the people. And this idea that people are just going to run down into our legislative houses and not show our power not show our rights, this idea that that is going to continue is about to fail. Now, guys, we're having problems with our stream. And so <clears throat> if things pause or get messed up, just know that our system is, it seems like it's almost being attacked. But we definitely want to thank uh, Representative uh, Austin Smith for coming. It has been a beautiful breath of uh, fresh air. We have been able to talk about real issues and guys, you get to see what it's like when somebody who understands the law really has a discussion with a politician. See, a lot of attorneys will say, oh, that's sovereign citizen stuff or that's crazy talk. But when we, the people use our power to have a discussion with government officials, with real facts, with real truth, it takes things to the next level. It takes things to the next level. Our signal is messing up, guys. We are going to try to see if the system can get back on track. And if it can, we are going to try to get uh, Daniel Wood on election integrity fighter. We are going to let him present because he has some powerful information that he wishes for us to hear. Now, 
it's telling me that zero people are watching, but people are actually uh, typing on the screen as I am watching. So this is something with Rumble where it is attempting to make it look like nobody's here, but I see people writing. It's unbelievable, guys. Now it jumped from zero to 123 people watching. So everybody, please share this because this is really important and the people need to know and understand what's happening. I don't know if the representative is, is still here. Uh, we should have Daniel Wood in the background if he is still here. Uh, it looks like we lost our connection. So what I'm going to do is stop this video and uh, to do this honor, I am going to stop it so the system can catch up. And then I'm going to get it uploaded on Rumble. And then we're going to come back and do the second part of the show with Daniel Wood, if he is willing and he is ready. Thank you guys for being uh, on here, watching so attentively. You guys are seeing history made. You see what happens when you really understand and know law and you teach and instruct the government service. You have intellectual conversations with them with real law. Don't bring crap to them. Don't argue with them over nothing. Don't be aggressive. Don't be mean, but use the wisdom that God gives us to have good discussions with powerful people and we can do mighty things. This video will shake the earth by God. I promise you. I will catch you guys later. Y'all stay out of trouble. Y'all be cool. We'll come back on with Daniel Wood if we can. Peace.